Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Kullu Allahu Ahad. Allahu Samad. Lam yulid wa lam yulad wa lam yakuluhu kufuwan ahad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I've got the real urge with this on my face to say we'll be flying at 2,000 feet and uh, we'll be coming into land in 20 minutes. So I'll try to not do that. Um, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's really, really a pleasure to be this far north in America with you. And what a great community you have here. What um, educated and active youth you have, which gives us great uh, hope when uh, Brother Halil and I visit places to see the next generation making the world and importantly these communities better uh, and more confident, alhamdulillah. So I've been a Muslim for just two years now, alhamdulillah. And two years ago I was not the person you see in front of you now. In fact, in most ways, I was the complete opposite of the version of the person that you see now. In fact, if I would have walked into that door and seen me here in a hijab, in this dress, I would have said, what did they do to you? I would have thought maybe I'd been kidnapped or given some kind of make you Muslim drug. Because I was not, it was not in my life plan to be Muslim was never going to happen to me. It was for other people and it was okay, but it was not in my five-year tenure or any part of my plan. But Allah knows best. And to Him is all the best planning. And here, to Him is all our gratitude for His best planning. In fact, one of, one, of my, one of the favorite dua that I love to make is, Oh Allah, make all the decisions for me. And I hand this all over to you, because I can't do anything right. <laughs> and I think admitting that is, is, is a really, it's a cleansing process. So, as I've been Muslim now for just over two years, I also have started to like listening to revert stories. I totally get it. It's really energizing and exciting to hear how Allah reaches out to different people in different ways. So I like listening to revert stories too, and I'm going to try and give you an overview of how I come to be standing here tonight as your sister. I'll start at the beginning. I grew up in the 1970s in London, and my parents were, well, my father was an actor, and my mother was a model at the time. And my father grew, had grown up a Roman Catholic, so a Christian, but he'd left the faith He'd become uh, disillusioned with the Catholic Church. My mother was superstitious more than religious. She would never go to church and she wouldn't dream of praying, but she liked to buy crosses in the markets and then hang them around our apartment to ward, away, ward off evil spirits. So that was really the full amount of religion I had in my early years. But the interesting thing for me to remember is that I always prayed. I was like this weird, pious kid that my parents found a bit strange. Because I was always, I liked to read the Bible when I was about nine years old. But when I was about five and six, I loved praying. It made total sense to me that there was God. I didn't know what he looked like, who he was, what his attributes were, but I felt that there was God with a certainty, and so I remember praying a lot. And I remember one particular prayer I would make, and it went like this. Dear God, please, please, please take my younger sister away. She's so horrible, God. She's so awful. She really was awful. Alhamdulillah. Allah loved her as well. She's still with us. <laughs> but I totally understood that there was, there was power in the world. My father had a little bit of power in the house. My mother had more. My grandfather had a little bit of power in his house. And my grandmother had really, she was the all powerful in the household. And then above them was God. He made the world tick. 
But it's not easy in the secular West, and Britain is secular now, and America is secular. Well, no, America's different, actually. No, I think Britain is much more secular than America. So we were growing up in a secular country, and it's very hard to hold on to the rope of Imam. I remember when I was 10 years old, and I had a sleepover. A friend from school came, and at bedtime, I put my hands together, and I said, Dear God, and she went, What are you doing? I said, I'm praying, don't you pray? She said, no, I don't pray. Who, who do you pray to? Is, is it the man on the cloud with a white beard? Tell me, who do you pray to? And she mocked me, but she made me think as well. And I realized I didn't know who God was. Was he on a cloud? If he was on a cloud, why couldn't I see him? If he had a white beard, did that mean he was old? If he got old, did that mean he was going to die? I didn't have any answers, so it became easier to stop praying than ask the questions. When you're surrounded with a lack of religion on all sides, it's easier to forget than to ponder the big questions, so I started to forget. And then, of course, when you're around 13 years old, you have a double disaster. So my hormones came into play at the same time as my ego suddenly, inexplicably rose. And I became arrogant and, and I forgot God. And by 14, in that era, all my friends were smoking drugs on the way to school and I joined them. I was smoking marijuana pretty heavily at 15, getting drunk regularly by 16, and that was pretty much it. God became a memory a memory in the corner of the universe. I didn't really know what he did anymore. I suspected he was still there, but I had no connection with him at all. So what did I know about Islam growing up? Well, I went to an all-girls school, and there were about three Muslim girls in my class. And it was a very racist time, the 80s. It wasn't a good time in Britain at all. I mean, we had names for every single color of skin. I think the Eskimos have a hundred words for snow. You know, we had a hundred words for, for foreigners and oh, it was really bad. So the Muslim girls, they had their little corner of the classroom and the white girls were everywhere else. And we didn't mix, we had nothing to say to each other. So all I could do was kind of observe Islam from a distance. And from watching Muslim girls for six years, I drew three or four conclusions about what Islam meant. Number one. Somehow being Muslim meant that your hair got shiny. Now, I didn't know why this was, but all those Muslim girls, they had the most amazing long shiny hair. I didn't know, maybe that was praying or something. The second thing I, I drew the conclusion that being Muslim somehow made you good at maths. Because all of the girls were in the top classes at maths. It annoyed the white girls. We didn't like it. Look at them, they're all in the top glass in maths. And the third thing was, all the Muslim girls, being Muslim meant you had to be a doctor or a dentist. And it still does, right? And the fourth thing was that clearly Islam was for Pakistanis. That was it. That was all I know about Islam until 9-11. So, where do you go from there in your life? What people want to know and always ask a revert is, okay then, so you were young and you lost your faith. What's the moment? Get to the moment when you felt things change for you. And I've thought about this a lot. And there is an image that captures the moment in time when everything in my life was about to change, only I didn't know it. And it comes down to the year 2000 when I had my daughter, Alexandra. And she was about a month old in December. And I, was, I would have been sitting on the sofa watching the evening news. And an image came on my screen for about no more than 15, maximum 20 seconds. Must have been 15 seconds, but I can see it now. And the image is of a young boy, 15 years old, and all you can see is his back. 
He's got a t-shirt on and jeans. But it's the way he was standing that took all of the breath in my body away because he was standing like this. His head was at such a proud angle and his arm, well his arm was poised to throw a stone. And I had never seen a man or a child so powerful in my life. And what was really striking was that just a few meters from that young boy was a tank and the tank was pointing its gun straight at him. I knew if he threw that stone, that tank would just disappear. Now that boy, his name was Faris Odeh. And the newspaper, the news people on TV told me that he came from a place I'd never heard of called Gaza. And specifically, he came from a refugee camp. And I want you please to remember the name of this refugee camp, because you'll hear it again in a little while, Rafa. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but Faris Oder, that boy in the photograph that touched my heart, he was shot dead nine days after that photograph. An Israeli bullet hit his throat and he bled to death on the floor of his refugee camp in Rafa, protecting all of the women in his family and in his village with a stone. Now that photo and the Qadr of Allah is the only explanation I have for every single day that I've had since. I promise you I have no other explanation for the way that my life has and continues to go, but I'm really grateful for it. Because five years later, I was a successful journalist. I had my own page in a newspaper with uh, my face on it. I had a column. It's a bit like being a movie star if you're in newspapers to have your own column. I had two daughters aged uh, in 2005. They would have been five and three years old, Holly and Alex, and I was living in France. I had a husband, I had a swimming pool, I had two houses, I was doing up a barn, I had everything in dunya. So what made me walk into my editor's office and say, Peter, I want to go to Palestine, please? I don't know. And I really don't know why Peter would have said, sure, here's the money for your trip. Go for two weeks. I'll give you four pages in the magazine. You see, he had no reason to do that. I wasn't a war correspondent. I wasn't a Middle East correspondent. I had no experience in covering these kinds of stories. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, when Allah has a plan for you, you can go to the left or the right, but you'll go in the direction of that plan. And three days later, I was outside Tel Aviv airport on my own. I didn't even know how to get from Israel to Palestine. That's how confused I was about the whole situation. I knew nothing except I had to go to Palestine. Now I had um, a bit of paper in my pocket and it had three Arab names on it that were, uh, I think they were politicians. I was trying to get an interview with Mahmoud Abbas. It was the uh, Palestinian elections. And a, a man came up to me as I was just thinking, what do I do? Okay, I'm at Tel Aviv airport. And he introduced himself like this. Hi, my name is Jamal. You can call me Jimmy. I said, hi, Jimmy. He said, where do you want to go to? I'm a taxi driver. I said, oh, okay, I want to go to Ramallah, please. Do you know it? He said, sure, no problem. Get in, <laughs> problem. I'm barking the car. I do accents because I come from an acting family. Allah forgive me. It's with love, I promise you. So we got into the car and he began driving me and it was 65 years of Palestinian history he gave me in 65 minutes was incredible. As we got outside uh, Jerusalem, we uh, got into the rolling hills of the Holy Land, that wonderful place you dream of, that you see it in your mind's eye. And our road got bumpier, but up in the hillside, I noticed going in the same direction was a beautiful road with nobody on it, brand new, looked like it had been paved yesterday. So I turned to Jimmy Jamal, I said, listen, I don't want to tell you your job, 
but why don't we go on that road? It seems to be much nicer than this one. I'm feeling car sick. He looked at me like I was crazy and said, are you sure you're a journalist? You don't know much about this, do you? I said, no, tell me. So he said, look, that road up there is for Jews only. I'm an Arab Palestinian. If I take you on that road, we will be shot dead in about five minutes. Do you want to go on that road? No, clearly I don't want to go on that road. One thought came into my mind, a single word, apartheid. Pretty soon we reached our first checkpoint at Columbia, and I remember the young 19-year-old soldier swung his gun casually towards Jimmy Jamal and reached for my passport, and he had a Brooklyn accent. Now, I didn't know that Brooklyn was a suburb of Tel Aviv, did you? It's amazing. So he uh, took my passport and he looked at it and he said, wow, Britain, we love you guys. I don't know why, I didn't feel particularly proud. That night, in the hotel room in Ramallah, I cried myself to sleep. I really sobbed down the phone to my husband. And what had I seen? I'd seen one apartheid road and one checkpoint. And I thought that was so criminal that I cried myself to sleep. And I wish with all my heart and all my soul that that was as bad as it gets. Now the next day, I don't know how, it was a bit of a miracle, I got a phone call and I was told, you have an interview with Mahmoud Abbas. Now, to meet a world leader on election day, security is tense. As a journalist, you can't just walk up to uh, Obama or Sarkozy or anybody. You have to meet their security, be vetted, be taken to meet them. So I was taken to meet Mahmoud Abbas by two of the biggest Arabs you've ever seen in your life. The security guard here on my right, six foot five. Security guard on my left, he's just a giant, six foot eight. I'm six foot and I'm going like this. And they both got guns kind of casually over their shoulders like this. And they put me into a metal container, which is an elevator. And then another Arab man says, give me your bag. And I give him my bag. Give me your phone. I give him my phone. And then I'm standing there and they close the doors. I remember one of the men's um, walkie-talkies went and he took it out and he said something like this. And I thought, subtitle, we'll kill the white woman later. Yeah, I was really, really scared. I was really scared. This is day one and I'm scared and I realize that I have Arabophobia, that I have unknowingly absorbed all of the negative imagery surrounding the question of Palestine, surrounding Muslims. I wasn't the liberal I thought I was. And you have to set foot in these places to realize your own prejudices. But brothers and sisters, they say that a week is a long time in politics. I can tell you now, three days is long enough to change your life in Palestine. 72 hours after that feeling, I had been treated so beautifully in so many different towns by so many different strangers that I would have given my life for any man, woman or child that I could protect. When Allah has a plan for you, you go to the left or the right, but you will go in the direction of that plan. I want to give you an example of the kind of generosity you meet. I didn't have my coat with me because the Israelis had kept my bags at a Ben Gurion airport for extra security checks. And so I was cold, it was January. And I was walking around Manar in Ramallah and an old lady saw me and thought, who is this crazy white woman with no coat? She came up to me and she said, yalla, 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 yalla. 
she just pulled my arm like this. And she took me into a little humble house and she took me straight into her bedroom and she opened a cupboard and she took out a big coat and put it on me. Then she found a little case and she put some jumpers in a case. She found a bit of paper and wrote what I, was her name and her address. And then she said, Salam Alaikum. And I was standing outside in the street in some stranger's warm coat, thinking, wow, I didn't know that still happened in the 21st century. I didn't know there were people this good. Subhanallah, there are people that good. They're Muslims. When Allah has a plan for you, you'll go to the left or the right, but you'll go in the direction of the plan. I really wasn't looking for Islam, but it kept being put in my path. I wasn't uh, seeking knowledge. Uh, in fact, I was probably avoiding knowledge as much as humanly possible, negating knowledge with massive amounts of alcohol. But in 2006, I still got given my first copy of the Quran. Shall I tell you how that happened? Well, I made an excuse to go back uh, as a journalist to the West Bank and Gaza. And my editor again gave me money and said, go for 10 days, which was crazy. Alhamdulillah, thanks be to Allah for that. And this time I went to Gaza. And I, you know, if I had more time, I could go into that experience. But what stayed with me about that trip was a place called Erez. Erez. The Gazan people aren't afraid of anything much. But when you say the word Erez, they do this. Because if you've seen any war films from the 1940s about what the Nazis did and about the kind of uh, watchtowers and machine guns and cattle areas with people crushed against grids, you'll have an idea of what it is just to get to work, what it used to be like to get to work for Palestinians. Now that checkpoint is closed to any Palestinian under 40. I was going through because I was heading out of Gaza to go back to uh, Tel Aviv and back home. But I had to have a driver. So I arrived at 10 o'clock in the morning and I found in my bag Jimmy Jamal's card from the year before. I thought, okay, this guy's never gonna remember me, but maybe, maybe he'll come this far to pick me up. So I rang and I said, hi, is that Jimmy Jamal? Is that Lauren? Salam alaikum, how are you? I was thinking to myself, do they not have any visitors? He remembered me. It's so great to hear from you. The sun has not risen since you have left our land. And we, uh, we praise Allah for your revisit. I'm like, wow, okay. Hi. Um, I said, look, can you please meet me at around one o'clock? I'm going to be coming through Erez. I'm going to give it three hours. He said, yeah, three hours should be on a good day, okay. So we arranged at one o'clock for him to meet me. But the Israelis were going to have fun with us that day. They just do it. That's what they do. So we got there at 10 o'clock and I was with UN workers, I was with members of the new Palestinian parliament. Ironically, I remember the Minister for Aviation. Um, it's a weird job because there's no aviation in Palestine, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> he gave me his card. Um, and, and an old lady who had to go and get an operation in America and she had a flight booked from Tel Aviv because she had a tumor on her spine. So we got to Erez at 10 a.m. and the old lady went through. She went through into a tunnel, a narrow tunnel where voices shout at you from speakers, tell you what to do. And uh, then she got sent back an hour later. She said, they won't let me through for my operation. So then they said, yeah, come through. And she went through no man's land and she disappeared. And we thought, great, she's gonna get, midday she came back. They did this hour after hour after hour until she started crying and she came up to me screaming in Arabic, why are they doing this to me? I'm not a terrorist, I'm an old lady. So we didn't get through the checkpoint, any of us, not at one, two, three, four, five, six. It was getting dark, it's dangerous at errors at six. 
The Israelis tend to shoot at shadows. Seven. Finally, they got bored and we started going through. And I got the same treatment as anybody, and it made me so humiliated and so angry. I'm ashamed to say the soldiers saw me cry. And it was tears of frustration. So then I get through the checkpoint at seven o'clock at night, and there's an empty parking lot, and uh, my phone is dead, and I booked the taxi for one o'clock, so I'm like, what now? And suddenly a car comes speeding towards me, reversing towards me, and the door is thrown open, and I look in, and Jimmy Jamal says, Salam alaikum, sister, how are you? I said, what, what, are you, what are you doing here? He said, I waited. I said, you waited six hours for a stranger? He said, we would never leave a woman on her own. It was my duty. Subhanallah. I got into his car and I started to cry. I cried because of what I'd seen, and I cried because he was so kind. And I cried in that snotty, really unattractive, not Hollywood movie. <laughs> They're horrible, and you're nice, and it's wrong. And he looked at me and he said, if you don't stop crying, I will take you to hospital. You're hysterical. You're frightening me. I can't stop crying. In the end, I was so upset, he refused to take me to the hotel I was booked into and took me to his wife's instead, and I was their guest. Alhamdulillah. Now, the next day, I haven't forgotten about the Quran. The next day, I had 40 minutes to do all of my souvenir shopping in the old city of Al-Quds, and I had a, a list on a piece of paper. Now, I was grumpy and it was raining. And I was standing there going, oh God, where am I gonna get these things? And a young Palestinian boy, maybe 20 years old, fell into step alongside me, like this. I don't know, they're amazing, you know, they just, subhanAllah. You go to Palestine, you see the shabab there, they're amazing, wallah. And when you see the, uh, there's nothing like seeing the dubka. If you see the dubka in, uh, in Gaza, they just leave the floor like this. I remember seeing the dubka and thinking, wow, the Israelis are never gonna win just because of the dubka. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, so this young guy, he just falls into step with me like this, and he says, Marhabar! And I'm a bit grumpy, so I go, ugh, not today, I don't want to do Marhabar today. And then I thought, don't you dare be rude to a Palestinian in their own land when they've been nothing but polite to you. You stop, and you Marhabar this young man. So I said, Marhabar, and he said, what can I do for you? I said, look, I've got, just got some shopping to do and I don't have much time. And he took the list and said, this is amazing. All of these men in the shops are my uncles. We can do the shopping together, no problem. So I read him my list and the list was two stuffed toy camels for my daughter Alex and Holly and a Yasser Arafat mother of pearl picture. I have no idea who wanted that. And um, what was the other thing? Oh yeah, a ceremonial knife for my husband. And at the bottom of the list, in small writing, a copy of the Quran in English. You see, by this point, I'd met enough Palestinian Muslims to start thinking, there's got to be something in that book. Is it like a manual on how to be nice? Because I've never met anybody these people are extraordinary, and maybe, maybe the secret's in that book, so I'm gonna get a copy. So I asked him. And the next 40 minutes, we went in and out of six or seven shops in the old, one of the old streets of Al-Quds. And of course, in every single shop, we had to sit down with the uncle and have mint tea. And every mint tea was so sweet that I think I had diabetes <laughs> by shop number five. 40 minutes later, I was outside in the street with all the things that I wanted in bags, including the Quran in English and lots of other gifts. And I turned to this young man, now remember, I'd never seen him before and I've never ever seen him again. I turned to the young man, I said, how much do I owe you? He looked at me and said, you don't owe me anything, but I ask for you to do one thing. Please don't forget Palestine when you go. SubhanAllah.
So that's how I got my first Quran, as a gift from the Palestinian people. Alhamdulillah. Now, when Allah has a plan for you, you can go to the left or the right, but you'll go in the direction of that plan. Despite the fact I was still drinking and I was bathed in arrogance, I was, I don't know, people called me a minor celebrity, whatever that means. I think it means you're a, an idiot who will go, you know, you'll go to any party that's free. And if this guy with his Islam didn't want me to drink, it was his problem, right? I have freedom in my country, yeah? So get over it. So I sat there and when I ordered the wine, Muhammad Ali, he didn't say anything. When the bottle was opened, he didn't say anything. When the wine was poured, he didn't say anything. And as I put it to my lips, he said, ah, 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 ah. He said, uh, Lauren, there are two things. Before you drink your wine, I have to say. Number one, the Islam channel won't be buying it for you. And number two, I can't sit here while you drink it, it's against my religion. So I will leave, you enjoy your wine, and we can continue afterwards. Salam Alaikum. Now, Muhammad Ali is a very smart guy, very shrewd. He could have sat at another table far away and texted and made his calls. That would have been okay. I think there's a school of thought that says that's okay. He didn't do that. He chose to go outside the whole restaurant and wait in the cold. Where I could see him, so I was drinking my wine and he was walking patiently up and down, waiting for me to drink on my own. And I had a feeling that I hadn't had since I was about 12 years old. And that feeling was shame. Shame on me. What had happened to me? What had happened to my heart? That I'd gone from this nice child into an adult who had no respect for people of faith. That I'd become a person who couldn't extend the most basic of courtesy to someone who had asked to meet me. I felt shame. And if you feel shame, it's a good thing. Allah wants us to feel shame because it monitors our behavior. I got rid of the wine and I motioned to Muhammad Ali and we recontinued the meeting. And then he said something amazing. He said, uh, I'd like to offer you a job as a presenter at the Islam channel. I said, do what now? He said, we want you to be a presenter at the Islam channel. I said, okay, I'll think about it. Two things. One. Please don't try and make me Muslim, okay? Don't, don't talk to me about Islam. Don't try and turn me into something I'm not. I'll tell you now, I'm never going to be Muslim. Muhammad Ali sat there. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whether or not you'll be Muslim, and you don't know. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Your Allah doesn't know. I know, and I'm not going to be Muslim. He said, Allah knows and you don't know. I said, no, 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 no. We agreed to disagree. The second thing was, I said to him, don't even ask me to wear hijab on your channel because I don't like the hijab and I think it oppresses women and I'm never going to wear it. Don't challenge Allah. Very foolish. Allah knows everything. Allah controls everything. I was the woman who was never going to wear hijab. The Titanic was the boat that was never going to sink. We have to remember to be grateful and to say inshallah before we say definitives. Although I would never say inshallah about not wearing the hijab now because I love the hijab. I took the job. And what did that mean? That meant for the next two years, I was traveling the world, meeting some of the modern world's greatest scholars, academics, clerics, and activists in the Muslim world. And one of the men that I met, his name is Sheikh Rayad Saleh. Sheikh Rayad Saleh is known as the Lion of Palestine. He is the leader of an Islamic movement in northern Israel and protector of Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, I met him in the foyer of a hotel at one o'clock in the morning. After a conference, I was doing an interview. 
and he walked up to me like this. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I looked at him and I thought, why do they call this guy the Lion of Palestine? He seems a bit quiet to me. But I liked his smile. And I liked that his smile wasn't directed at me. He never looked me fully in the face during the whole hour that I interviewed him. He just flicked his eyes generally towards me. Now, as a Western journalist, you aren't taught, but you kind of inherit the feeling that if Muslim men don't look you in the face, it's because they hate your stinking kafir skin and they will vomit if they look into your eyes. You kind of have this in the back of your mind. But when I sat opposite Sheikh Raid Salah, I just didn't feel that. I felt, what a lovely, humble man. What a lovely, respectful human being. And more than that, as I sat opposite him, there were waves of peace coming from him. That's the only way I can describe it. And even as a non-Muslim, you feel it. And I now know the word for it is Iman. Iman. I felt that he was somewhere else, and I wanted to go to that somewhere else. SubhanAllah. When Allah has a plan for you, you can go to the left or the right, but you'll go in the direction of that plan. I told you I wasn't seeking knowledge. I wasn't. But there's something that comes up, you'll notice, in a lot of revert stories. The word truth is often brought up. Brother Khalil will tell you he was seeking for the truth. He wanted to show the truth to a Muslim. If, if you ask Allah, if you ask God to show you the truth, you will be guided to Islam. Allah is the truth within all truth. But I wanted justice. I didn't, it wasn't truth in Islam or in religious. I wanted justice for the people of Palestine. And justice is also another route. Now, I wasn't looking for the truth, so I wasn't look, getting dawah from any uh, learning, but I was still getting dawah from one particular place, and it was a surprising place. Somalian taxi drivers. Somalian taxi drivers. They are the silent army of Allah. In every city around the world right now, somebody will be getting into a Somalian taxi cab and they will be getting a lecture in Islam whether they want it or not. I used to get into these cabs and uh, I'd say, Salam Alaikum, because I'd been to the West Bank and I thought it was all clever. Oh, look, a little bit of Arabic, Salam Alaikum. And they would immediately look amazed and say, Wa Alaikum Salam. As a prophet, peace be upon him, said to his wife, Aisha, da -la 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 -la. and they'd be off and they'd be unstoppable. And they would have hadith and uh, Quran on the tip of their tongue. And I would get these most amazing stories. And what I found happened after a few months, a few times of this happening was whenever I heard a particular name, it felt like my heart was growing. And that name was Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I felt like I had a very tight ball of cement in the middle of my chest that was my heart. But when I heard about this guy, Muhammad, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it seemed to grow. That's the only way I can describe it. I just remember thinking, he sounds amazing. I would like to have met this guy. You know, uh, soon after I came to Islam, I had a book, it's called uh, Muhammad by Martin Lings, the author. And I was reading it on the way to work, and I'd been Muslim about eight, ten weeks. And I got into work, and I shut, my, I shut the office door, and I bawled my eyes out. I cried so much that I had to call my sheikh. I couldn't stop crying. I called him, I said, <gasps> Sheikh. He said, sister, what is the problem? What's the matter? <laughs> he said, has somebody died? No. Are the children okay? Yes. What is it? He said, I love him. He said, you're in love. I said, no. He said, what? I love Muhammad. <laughs> and he laughed. He said, ah, alhamdulillah, this is a good sign. Don't worry. It's very normal. Subhanallah. Totally overwhelmed. 
totally overwhelming. Well, I didn't know that at the time, and I was getting dour from these taxi drivers, and you know, today, I do sometimes get into cabs in London, and the majority of the drivers are still Somalian. But now, I'm obviously a Muslim sister. And so when I say, Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, they say, Wa alaikum salam, and then, they have one question for me. And it's always exactly the same question. Are you married? <laughs> Are you married? No sunnah, no hadith, no Quran. Why is that? What's changed? Somebody will tell me someday, inshallah. And may Allah bless them all, Allah. I just want to say to you all, please in your lives, watch out for the signifiers that Allah is giving you a chance to come closer to him. It can be very small things. His ayah are all around us. You just have to be aware of it. My next change, my next sign came in 2008 and it was just uh, an email, a few words, maybe a dozen words. And it just said this, would you like to go to Gaza by boat? Call this number. I looked at it in my inbox and I didn't even know the person who'd sent it to me. Would you like to go to Gaza by boat? Call this number. I shouldn't have called the number. I had two daughters who were young, but I, you see, I knew what the siege was doing to the people of Gaza because I was an activist by that time. And as we got closer, there were dots we didn't think anybody knew we were coming, by the way, because Israel had scrambled all of our communication systems. So we had no, uh, no phones, no radio. We had two walkie-talkies, that was it. And we didn't know anybody had remembered that we were coming, but we saw these dots on the horizon. And as we got closer, we saw there were tens of thousands of Palestinians. The men had slept, some of them for three days on the beach, unable to believe these crazy Europeans and Americans were actually on boats traveling past the Israeli naval blockade to come to see them. And as we got closer, we heard the sound and it hit us like a wave and the sound was this, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It was the most beautiful day of our lives. Three days later, the Free Gaza and the Liberty went back to Europe. I hadn't seen my daughters for a month. My baby daughters, who were calling me every night saying, Mommy, don't you love us? Why don't you come home? But you see, we'd been hiding the boats from Mossad. A month I hadn't seen my daughters, but I watched the Free Gaza sail and I was illegal in Gaza. And I have no idea why I did that. I can only tell you it felt like my feet were glued to the soil of Palestine. And in the end, it took me one whole month to get out, to get permission from Egypt to leave. And do you know what month of the year that was? It was Ramadan, subhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had put me in Gaza for the whole month of Ramadan. What an honor, what an honor. SubhanAllah, to be with some of the best Muslims alive in the Ummah today as they fasted for Allah. One night, I've been invited to a place that I asked you to remember at the beginning, the Rafa refugee camp. I've been invited to a family and asked to take some meat around because they weren't having anything for their iftar. And I knocked on the door and the door was more bullet holes than plasters because Israel bombs and bulldozes and attacks Rafa all the time. And I knocked on the door and a woman answered it like this. Salaamu Alaikum, Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh, Fadal. She was shining. She was shining. Her face was full of light. Her eyes were glowing. Her smile made my heart burst in my chest. And I thought to myself, she can't be poor. It's not possible to be poor and this happy. Maybe behind that door, it's like Aladdin's cave. Yeah. Maybe she's got a lot of gold in there. Yeah, we'll see. And I went into her home, and what did I see? 
I saw an empty, small cement room with nothing in it. Nothing. There was a rug on the floor, an ancient dusty rug, and some old mattresses around the walls that at night would be pulled down and aunts and uncles and mothers and fathers and children would sleep on that floor with no covers. And I felt really angry for the first time at Islam. You see, I wasn't Muslim. And I didn't understand why people who were already hungry should fast. It made no sense to me. What is the point of putting people who are already suffering through hardship? I thought Islam was stupid. So I said to this mother of Rafa, I was quite aggressive because I felt angry against this God who made people hungry. I said, why do you fast? You say your God asks you to go hungry for 30 days. I say you're always hungry. You say your God asks you to go thirsty. I say your water is disgusting all year. Give me one good reason why you fast in Ramadan. This mother of Rafa looked at me and she said, I fast in Ramadan to remember the poor. SubhanAllah. The poorest woman I had ever met in my life was fasting to stay humble. At that moment, a key went into my heart and a thought came right into my mind. If this is Islam, I want to be Muslim. If this humility with nothing is Islam, I want to be Muslim. If this gratitude to God, to Allah, for whatever he chooses to give you on that day, if this gratitude is Islam, I want to be Muslim. And if this love for your fellow man, if that's Islam, let me be Muslim. Subhanallah. And that lady, later on, she showed me to the door and she said, Assalamu alaikum. And I did what so many human beings have done before me. I went right back out and I completely forgot about Allah. I went straight back to sinning and being selfish and drinking alcohol and not being kind and not praying and I forgot about Allah but you know what is beautiful? Allah never forgot about me. Allah never forgot about me. And he never forgets about you. Remember that no matter how far you go, he has not forgotten about you. He is our Rahman our Rahim. Two years went past in the blink of an eye and in Ramadan 2010, I found myself again in a Muslim country outside a masjid this time. And my friend said, wow, it's Maghrib time. Time for iftar, why don't we go in and pray? Come with us. I said, yeah, okay, why not? I wanted to see what Muslim women did in a mosque in Ramadan. Did they kill goats? Did they drink blood? What was the weird rituals that they were getting up to? Wow, I went as a nosy tourist. Nothing more. But I did do one thing out of respect, because it was Ramadan, I made wudu before I went in. And when I crossed the threshold of this mosque, I made a quick dua. I prayed. I said, dear Allah, I'm not here today to ask you for anything because you've given me such a nice life. And I said, thank you. And I don't think, I don't think I'd said thank you as an adult to Allah, not once. And I said, thank you. And then I said, I don't ask for anything, just one thing, please, 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 bless Palestine. And then I sat down. And when I sat down, it was as if a wave of peace hit me. It took away every thought, every worry, every insecurity, every mean thought, and I was just under a waterfall of tranquility. And this tranquility was so immense that I understood at that moment, at that time, that the whole of creation is based on this peace and that all of the problems, we make them. 
human beings, we make the problems. God does not make problems, we make the problems. And God is peace, and I got it. And I sat there, and I sat there, and I was with a friend, and she was very patient, and I was just looking at my hands. And you know what? I don't know how long I sat there, but I forgot my name. I forgot who I was, and that felt so good. And after a while, my friend said we should go to our hotel, and I said, no thank you. Can I sleep on the floor of the mosque tonight? She said, sure. My mum and I will join you. And we slept on the floor of the mosque. And in the morning, I heard the call to prayer inside the masjid. And it was a beautiful masjid of white stone with doves flying over the courtyard. And I prayed Fajr. Allah Akbar. And then uh, around five o'clock in the morning with the sun coming up, I left the masjid for the first time in 12 hours. And then shaitan started with me because I stood outside and all my thoughts came back all at once. Everything. It's like my brain had been uh, put into tranquil mode and now it all came back. You can't be Muslim, you don't know the Quran, you don't know these people, you can't be modest, you can't stop eating sausages, you can't stop drinking, you can't, you can't wear modest clothing, you don't know the Quran, you don't know the prophets, you can't, you can't, you can't. And I started to have a panic attack like this. <gasps> because I was so, so scared. Because you, I knew, see I knew, I knew what that feeling meant meant Islam was true, it meant the books were true, it meant Allah was one, it meant Muhammad was the last prophet, it meant the angels were true in the last day, in the Qadr of Allah, and I knew it was true, but I was battling it, and I was so afraid, I was terrified, and then a voice in my head said, stop, just carry on with your life, you're going to be okay, just carry on, you'll be all right. And I immediately thought, what an idiot, why have I been freaking out? So what? I had one nice feeling in a masjid, that doesn't mean I have to be Muslim, I'll just get on with my life. And I did, I tried to get on with my life. I got back into the car and we carried on travelling, me and my friend Nargis, but there was a problem. Every time we passed a masjid on the road, I so wanted to go and pray. I so wanted to go and pray. And you know, and I'm so ashamed today. I hate this feeling. Ah, oh, you know, when the Adhan goes and you drag yourself like, ugh, oh, can I be bothered to pray? Ya Allah, that day and many days afterwards, I was longing to pray. I wanted to run. Uh, and I didn't really know how to pray. But I did know that when I went into sujood for the first time and I said, I'm sorry, and I said, thank you, it was as if I was born, as if, as if everything was new to me after that. And seven days later, I walked into a masjid in London and I said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Alhamdulillah. So that's my story how I became a Muslim, alhamdulillah. And I want to leave you with the word alhamdulillah. We started with that, it's good that we finish with that. Because gratitude is the greatest thing that Allah has given us. I know a young man, his name is Muhammad. And in 2009, I was with him two weeks ago. In 2009, he was 21 years old. He was at his uncle's house. And the Israelis sent an F-16 to his uncle's house and it came down on the family. And his friends, pulled Muhammad out of the rubble. You see, but when they pulled him out, his legs didn't come with him. And both his legs came off above the knee. Muhammad went immediately into a coma, but he revived for five or 10 seconds, and his friends were shouting, your legs, you have no legs. Muhammad said, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And he said it with sincerity. And I met him again two weeks ago, and he told me how when he uh, woke up in a Cairo hospital after being in a coma for five days, his mother was crying at the end of his bed. She said, Habibi, you have no legs. The first word that left his mouth was Alhamdulillah. He said, look, mom, I have my hands. 
Allah has left my hands. And he said, look, mom, Allah has left my eyes so I can see you. And Allah is most kind, alhamdulillah. So brothers and sisters, let us be grateful today and to remember how much we've been given and how many chances and that why has Allah put us in a wealthy place? Has he put us here to make money and buy big cars? Is that what Allah does? Go into dunya. Has he taken you from Pakistan and Bangladesh and Yemen and Africa and all the other places around the world? Has he put you in America to get selfish and greedy? Or is there a greater purpose? Is it da'wah and is it alhamdulillah? So I ask Allah to bless you all for coming and spending your evening to hear about him and the ways of doing justice and to reward you and to bless our brothers and sisters in Bangladesh and to please remember all those in Pakistan who have just voted and to give them stability. To bless our brothers and sisters in Syria, bless our brothers and sisters in Syria. Okay, I said, Mummy's thinking about becoming Muslim, what do you think? And they said, we're going to make a list of questions and we'll be right back. That's what they're like. And they came back and they just had three questions. And question number one was, Mummy, when you are Muslim, will you still be mummy? I said, yeah, I'll still be your mummy. In fact, I'll be a better mummy, inshallah. Question number two was, when you are a Muslim, will you still drink alcohol? It was a hard one for me, I told you. I said, I'll never drink alcohol again. My daughter said, hooray. Then they said, when you are a Muslim, will you still show your chest in public? I said, what? <laughs> Holly said, you always wear low cut tops and even my teachers can see your chest and I hate it, stop it. I said, look here, if I'm Muslim, I'll be covered from head to foot whenever I leave the house. And they said, we love Islam. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. My daughter Alex took her shahada in Ramadan last year and she wears hijab, alhamdulillah. She's 12. And my daughter Holly is 10. And if you say, Holly, are you Muslim? She'll say, I'm just practicing. <laughs> Which I think is brilliant and I'm not gonna correct because we're all practicing to get better, right? Maybe that's what practicing means. So I like it. Now my mother was a, a different kettle of fish. My mom, reads right-wing newspapers and probably thinks Fox News is pro-Islam. And when I came back and I told her I'd had an experience in a mosque, she cried. She said, I've only ever wanted peace in my heart and I want peace in your heart, so I'm happy for you. I said, really? She said, whatever you decide. I thought, subhanAllah, Allah is amazing. And the next time I saw her, I was wearing hijab. She looked at me and said, what do you got that on your head for? I said, uh, remember I said I was going to convert. Mom, I'm Muslim. She said, Muslim? I thought you meant Buddhist. <laughs> well, you've joined the nutters, have you? I said, yeah, Mom, I joined the nutters. But uh, I tried in the last two years to be a better daughter. I wasn't a good daughter before Islam. It's one of the many things that I've, I've learned to be better at. And so I, I wrote her an apology letter and then started acting on it and looking after her and being kinder. And now my mother, after two years, she still thinks that Islam is for terrorists, but she thinks that those terrorists love their mothers. So I don't know, I, it's the best I can do, I'm trying. Please, alhamdulillah. Um, if anybody wants to know what Tony Blair thinks, she'll have to ask him. Sorry, I don't know. Um, but why don't we all pray for to come to Islam? How about that, inshallah? Yes, another question from the sisters. Yes. Did I go where? Aksa. Oh, you know what? The, the Israelis would have let me in. You know, uh, you do you know that Palestinians under 40 can't go into Al Aqsa? Do you know that? They can't go in. Did you know people who live around Alexa, they can't pray in Alexa? Why? Yeah, well, that's a big question. Because the Israelis want to stop all Muslims going to Alexa, and they're beginning with the Palestinians. And I'll tell you now, that they are, if it wasn't for the Palestinians, none of us would have been able, none of the Ummah would have prayed there for 65 years. 
So we owe them a big debt of gratitude. Allah has made the Palestinians strong to protect Aqsa. So, you know, Hedy Epstein there, uh, is one of my favorite people alive. She's about 88 years old. She's, uh, her, fa her family died in the Holocaust and she's wanted to go to Gaza. She was, trying, she was on the uh, free Gaza, but uh, she had to come off because she was getting death threat from Jews. And they made her so sick she had to go to hospital. And uh, she's been had death threats and all sorts. So there are wonderful people out there. But look, no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. I want to see every synagogue talking about justice for Palestine before we talk about peace. What? Sorry. It's my point of view and is no way reflective of this association here or the MLFA. This is the personal views of Lauren Booth. You are under a lot of pressure here. You are really under a lot of pressure here. Um, if, you, if you stop resisting the pressure that you're under in your, uh, in your country and in your communities, um, if you don't stand up for your rights, if you don't stick together, if somebody innocent from your community is taken and accused of uh, terrorism and you know they had nothing to do with it, don't say, oh, I'm not going to go around and see the family. The CIA might want me. What is this? How can they divide the Ummah this easily? You have to unite together and stick together. We do that in Britain. I have to say, you know, the brothers are strong there. They say, don't mess with the Pakistanis, man. <laughs> mess with the Pakistanis. I like, uh, you know, really, wallah. So we're out on the streets and we're like, right, you can mess with us and you can play your games, but we're going to be on the streets, we're going to be in your face and we're not having it. And Allah is one and Muhammad is there and alhamdulillah. We want our rights. So yeah, so we get that right. So, so just be stronger, that's all. We get some things right. But your organization, your forward thinking, your associations, your clean masjids, your madrasas, these are all great. The stuff you have going on with the youngsters and the women are treated better, that's all great. Be brave, please. Inshallah. Salam.